Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Serpe, Senior Events Manager at the ARF, and I'd like to welcome you to our event today, How to Win an ARF David Ogilvy Award. This afternoon, we'll hear more about the awards program, criteria, and best practices on how to improve your award application. First, let me wa quickly walk you through a little background about the awards. Established over 25 years ago by the ARF, the David Ogilvy Awards are the premier competition to honor the best in class for insight and data-driven advertising campaigns. The awards pay tribute to the late David Ogilvy, creator and legend, behind some of the biggest fundamentals in advertising still being used today. With these awards, we celebrate his forward-thinking belief in the important relationship between research and effective advertising. The awards are crucial in today's environment. To focus on data-driven solutions is more relevant now than ever. Winning an award gives you an opportunity to strengthen your client relationships, generate new business and industry attention, give kudos to your team, and gain press coverage. Before I introduce our speakers today, let's quickly cover the awards criteria. Here's a snapshot view. Applicants are asked to consider the following when entering the awards. The methodology and astuteness of the insight, the strength of the creative idea, and the resulting performance and measurable impact. Our juries also consider these same criteria when making their analysis, and a more thorough look at our criteria and guidelines can be found in our entry kit. The criteria seem simple enough, so why are we here today? We're here to provide a direct resource to take your application to the next level, behind the conversations in the jury rooms, and reveal what nuances matter most, taking an average entry to an outstanding entry. The need for this event organically arose from conversations with our past committees and jurors, looking to broaden the scope of applications and help guide our members step-by-step step through the most important elements of the written application. We also want to address any common misconceptions about the award, such as only big budget campaigns can win. Not true. Only marketers and agencies can apply and be honored. Not true at all. We honor the team effort that goes into a successful campaign, including the work from research and media companies, among other contributors, and addressing the idea that the application is intimidating. It's not if you know how to write a clear, concise brand story. With that, let me welcome Anne Green, SVP Client Partner at Kantar, and Abby Hollister, Principal at Formative Insights and Partner at The Rational Heart grand jurors and insights experts who are our speakers today. Rachel Feigenbaum, SVP of events at the ARF will also be joining us later to pose some questions to our speakers and field questions from the audience. So be sure to send in your questions throughout the event in the Q&A or chat box. Now to Abby and Anne, um, I'm gonna kick it off with two questions. As grand jurors, what do you think constitutes a successful entry and what excites you? Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'll get us started. And I'll start by thinking about um, what excites me when I'm taking a look at different case studies. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, I'm, I'm not looking for something that comes from a really exciting category necessarily or something with a really big media budget or big brand. Um, what really excites me in an entry is really about the insight. So one, these are of course the advertising research um, awards. So coming from the ARF. So um, what excites me is this, you know, really great work that came out of a really great insight. Um, and it's really clear that the case uses an insight, not just, you know, by sticking it into the application, but that the insight is clearly the basis for everything that follows. It's the basis for the strategy, the basis for the tactics, and then also, of course, the creative elements that follow that then, of course, create some business impact. But it's really that the foundation comes from insight. Um, I would say, though, the, the issue for me that I've seen um, time and time again when I've judged over all the years um, has been that I feel like there's some lack of understanding of what um, a great insight is. 
Um, and, and to address that, I think it's really important for us to clearly note what is not an insight. Um, you know, an, an insight is not just a data point. It's not a statistic that I pulled out of some research. It's not a you know, generally widely known or believed piece of knowledge about a certain group of consumers. Um, and it is definitely not an idea that the team came up with in a planning session and then someone left and found some data to back it up. Um, an insight uh, is really something so much more than that. You know, definitely comes from data. It definitely comes from statistics, but it's so much more. Um, I'm a nerd and I love to go look at look up things in the dictionary just to get the basis of what things are. Um, so I, of course, looked up insight for this. And an insight is def defined in Webster's as the power or act of seeing into a situation or the act of or result of apprehending the inner nature of things or seeing of seeing intuitively. Um, perception is a synonym, synonym that they list. So as you can see from that, an insight is so much more um, than just a data point. Um, it may be born out of a single data point, but it is so much more about it. Um, and I think my favorite way of defining an insight is one I took away from a conference probably 10 plus years ago. I don't even remember who the keynote was anymore, but I walked away with this really clear, interesting idea about insights. Um, he said, an insight is something that once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, it's that aha moment you have when you're able to see something so clearly that you just couldn't see before, but now that you've seen it, it, it can't be unseen. Um, so you know, think about that aha, something strikes you with something really exciting in the data or research. Um, the speaker paralleled it to some of those like you can't unsee it pictures or those um, like illusion pictures um, where they're really hard to discern at first. Um, there's a popular one that's like a, a white page with a bunch of black dots and splotches on it. And it's sort of parallel to finding those pictures, right? You sit and you look at it and you have to find patterns. You have to look at different pieces of it with different contexts behind it. Um, you look at it from different angles. You find disconnects. You look for the continuity. And then you see it. There's a Dalmatian in the middle of all those black spots. And now that you've seen that Dalmatian, you can't unsee him. Um, but it took work to get there. And for me, that's what I want to see in your insight in a really great case study is that while it might be a simple statement, you know, just one sentence in your entry, um, it really shows that you took the time to look at your research, to look at your data and all the insight or important information that you have. And you took the time to see patterns. You looked at all of the different contexts and continuity and disconnects. And then, aha, you saw something really important. Um, and then out comes this insight. And this insight is something that you uniquely know because of your research and your ability to understand it in a meaningful way and tie it to your brand. So you look at that and that sounds like a lot and it is, but that's really the point of why it's the foundation of all of the work that you do. Um, one of the case studies that I judge that is probably one of my favorite of all time through all of the years was the Noah's Beautiful campaign um, from Pure Leaf. And they had a very simple insight. It's a single sentence. Um, there's a need to focus on what's important in life. However, it's difficult to block out the clutter of everyday daily life. You know, that's a simple statement and it sounds so um, easy, but it really took time and effort to look at what they had in terms of research and break down what was going to be really meaningful to their audience and be something that they could tie to their brand in a really beautiful way. Um, so when you think about that, they had this great insight and it became the foundation for a really interesting campaign of Noah's Beautiful that could connect to their audience so uniquely because it connected with this human truth that it's really hard to say no, <laughs> but it's so important for our lives and our personal and mental health. So that, you know, out of that was born a campaign that had great impact on their business. Um, other thing that stuck out to me in that case study and several others that also gets me excited um, and is really something I look for in a case is 
really that clarity of storytelling. Um, so when you think about storytelling, I know we use the word like way too often and it becomes, you know, sort of the, in the white noise. But when I say that, I really mean that somebody has taken the time to write a really clear narrative. They took the time to be concise. Um, you know, clar clarity of storytelling tells me two things. It tells me that you took the time to really decide what your message was before you wrote your case study. And you took the time to decide what you want me as the juror to take away from the case. So there's, you know, two things going into your writing and you wrote that in a very focused way. Um, these, you know, I think in the case studies, less is more. I don't need to know everything that went on in the background. Um, what I really wanna know is the narrative. Tell me what got you excited. Tell me what is most important in your case and help me focus on that. Um, sorry, Anne, I'm gonna steal a quote from you that you had in, in our prep session. You can repeat it later too. Um, but it was a Mark Twain quote that I like, it stuck out so much to me was if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. Um, sorry, Anne. but I think that really tells the idea of a concise story so well is that you took the time to decide on your message, hone it, and tell us what was really exciting about it. I mean, as judges, it's not just because we're judging probably 20 cases or something in that amount of time. I don't really want to read something with a ton of extraneous information, but a really well-focused story tells me what you got excited about and gets me excited. So that's you know, really, really important to me. Um, otherwise it kind of gets lost in the noise. And so you know, just writing in a concise way, listen to the word minimums, not just because they get too long, but because they really help you focus um, on what's important. So what about you, Anne? What do you think is, is most exciting to you? Well, you owe me a quote, Abby, so I'm going <laughs> to hold you to that. Um, but it's really interesting. I think when you and I were both looking at the opportunity to talk a little bit about David Oakley's, it goes without saying that these are research-based awards. So, you know, it is table stakes to be thinking about the role of the research and the role of the research and how it fueled that insight and how it fueled the campaign and proved its efficacy, proved its impact. That is a given. But it, when I'm looking at submissions, I'm really looking for two things beyond that. Um, one is just your passion. I think what we do as an industry is really fun. Um, it's really exciting. And I can always spot the cases where the team is feeling as passionate about their campaign as, as we should be. And I want to feel that coming through in your submission. Um, the second thing, and, and again, building on what Abby said about storytelling, what I'm looking for in a story is not just that it is clear that it is crisp, but also that it is end to end. So I want to be able to follow your storyline from the insight to the execution to the in-market impact. I want to be able to follow what you're doing throughout the process. And I want to see very clear linkages throughout the process. And one of the areas I've been thinking about is what we see in terms of impact or business metrics. And when I'm talking about business metrics, I'm talking about those things that are really measurable. Um, they're meaningful. So in other words, one of the things I sometimes see is, hey, we got 400 Facebook likes. Well, that's lovely, but I don't really know what that means in business terms. And then ultimately, what I'm looking for is that it ties to the objective. So you set out to accomplish X, and here is the proof of the fact that we did it. So don't try to re-engineer. Don't try to include a ton of metrics because this is a research-based award. Don't feel compelled to sort of data load in the metric section. Think about really what I was looking to do as a business and tie it back to what you're showing in terms of business impact. And I think business metrics can be really diverse. You know, so we think about them traditionally in terms of share, 
in terms of ROI, um, ability to command a premium. It could be awareness of a new product. It could be purchase intent. It could be retail distribution. There are a lot of different ways in which you can show your business impact. And the case study I really like to, to talk about is the Bubbly case study. Um, it was a young brand at the time in a very, very crowded market. It had to do something different. And so they had an insight about adulting is hard for millennials. Now, I must admit, I think adulting is hard for all of us, but they, they really had this unique lens to adulting being quite hard for millennials. And the fact that, you know, sort of the cultural lens, the environmental lens that they were under was rather unique and magnified this idea of adulting at this point in their lives. And they wanted to highlight the, the notion that a little bit of play is a good reason. We don't have to be doing, you know, taking ourselves so seriously all of the time. Play is good. And so Bubbly decided that their manifesto was going to be, you know, we are going to break up the mundane. We are going to break up the mundane, not just of life, but of this category and really allow consumers to simply crack a smile. And a lot of you have probably seen versions of the campaign, um, but basically what we're seeing is that um, executionally they delivered with Michael Buble. He was sort of the playful foil for the bubbly brand. And um, in essence, you know, really created this new sort of view to the category and to bubbly specifically. When I look at their impact, their brand awareness grew by 77%. So for a new young brand, growing by 77% is huge. Um, they also doubled their retail sales in 2019, and they tripled their category share. So just a really impactful campaign, but told a story that was a clear thread and also, again, tied back to the, the goal, which was we are a new brand in this marketplace and we need to really do something differently. We need to break through. So, Rachel, I think you were going to ask some questions of the audience. Or have I some am. Questions. Yes. Hello, everyone. And um, and I think your sound, it's wobbling just a little. I don't know if you can adjust anything on your mic, but we'll we'll continue on. I can I can hear you and we'll have the key summaries. Um, so th first of all, thank you both uh, for your words of wisdom. Um, a reminder to everyone, please feel free to put some questions through. I do want to start with one. Um, so you've both you've talked about Cureleaf, you've talked about Bubbly as examples. Um, which is great, and they both happen to be beverages. Um, so do you have other submissions, other campaigns you can share, you know, that exemplified uh, the aha moment and the connection, the threading it through from, um, you know, initial um, impact to measurability? Yeah, I think that that's a, a, a great point. And I, I was looking at some of the other submissions that we had, and one was for social responsibility. It was for not a gun. So a lot of you are probably familiar with that campaign, but you think, how do I show the business impact of a social responsibility campaign? Well, the business impact in this case was the training initiative that they undertook with the Austin Police Department and the implementation and the impact that that had on the community. But also after launching the campaign, they had an increase of 1400% interest in similar training initiatives. I mean, that, that's a huge business impact. You think about how much of our communities can be impacted by the sheer fact that our police force are having access to this kind of training. Mm -hmm. I think the, the other one that was really interesting for me was census. Um, census you know, was a, obviously a government uh, submission so again, you think, how on earth do I show business impact of that? But very similarly, what they were able to do is demonstrate that it was over 99% of the population did complete the census. Well, first of all, that is their primary objective. 
is to maximize completion of their census. But they also demonstrated very high awareness of the census within the first few weeks of the campaign. So in other words, they had to get people aware that this was a census year, that this was going to be important for them to participate. And they had very high awareness of that. And then the third component that they included was this idea of linking the actual self response to when the campaign was airing. So they found that there was a direct relationship between the amount of self response that tied in with the timing of the campaign. Mm -hmm. So really some impressive proof points there that are outside of the traditional share. Um, for me, I think one of the other case studies that really excited me was the Project Understood case study with Google. Um, and that was really you know, about experience. Um, and that case study, of course, was <clears throat> about taking the Google Voice and creating um, an opportunity for Down syndrome individuals to be able to use it. And this such such a strong insight that I think most of us would not think of um, in terms of the fact that while voice technology is, you know, it's very convenient and it's awesome that I can add to my uh, shopping list while I'm <clears throat> while I'm cooking. But for people with Down syndrome, it's really a life changing way to gain independence and has such a challenge in the fact that voice assistants can't necessarily understand the different speech patterns of those with Down syndrome. And so taking this really interesting and um, important insight, they were able to create a campaign and project understood that was um, one, a, an amazing campaign in and of itself, but two, had such a strong impact in what it was able to do um, in terms of gaining such a huge amount of organic reach, which was very important for something like this, where the spend avail availability is so low. So talk about something that doesn't have high spend. Um, but they were also able to get organic reach. They had 30 plus countries um, interact with the campaign. They also had over a million voices donated to their re recognition database, which was really the key, you know, uh, and talked about the business objective. Well, the business objective of this campaign was to get people to donate their voice so that they could start to learn and program algorithms to understand the different speech patterns. And if you get a million voices donated, you have so many more data points. And that really drove the success of the campaign was not that it just got out there, but it had strong impact. And so um, reading the camp, that case as well, you know, it really talks about the passion that was involved and you got excited just reading the case. So again, going back to that idea that the way that you write your case, it doesn't have to be a masterpiece. It just needs to be focused and passionate in helping us understand why it was such an exciting um, project to work on and why it conveyed the creativity and passion that you have for what you do. Um, and I think it came up earlier on in the session that it doesn't have to just come from the creatives. It doesn't just have to come from the brand. Anyone who feels really passionate about the work that they've done, I think can put a really strong case study together. Um, because if you can write well and you can convey your passion and excitement, then write it and do it um, and just link that insight to, to the impact that you had. And I think then you'll have a strong case no matter what you were talking about, um, whether it be like a big brand owned by Pepsi or you know something that had no spend coming out of um, the Down Syndrome Association in Canada. <laughs> Now, well said, and as a reminder, I think we have these case studies linked on our website. So it, to really bring it to life, especially, um, especially the Google one, you know, watch it, <laughs> uh, just watch it. I have one other question before we go to some Q&A. So, you know, we, we've seen examples you've mentioned, which include campaigns, obviously from beverages, social responsibility, public service, inclusivity, you know, the topics are diverse. Um, but there are what we call different degrees of difficulty among categories. So some categories are more saturated, like beverages, a lot of CPG categories. Others pull at your heartstrings, um, literally like the not a voice one you just mentioned, Abby. Uh, so it's kind of a good reminder um, 
you know, juries, you all right, you're not judging entries based on the type of brand or the product, but how cogent the entry is. I think we keep underlining that. So is there anything more you can add without beating a dead horse? But I just think that's, that's an important point to make. I think Anne touched on it, but it's really big for me too, is that weaving a clear thread through your campaign um, from the start to the finish, what, how has everything tied together? You started with your insight, how you got there, how, where that took you on your journey, why that's impacted your creative choices that you made. Um, I think that tying all of that together is very clear. Um, when it's very clear, it makes for a very impactful case study, um, much more so than if you think about each piece of your, um, your written application as a very distinct piece. They shouldn't be distinct and completely separate. They should be really woven together, clearly showing how your insight made an impact on everything, including your objectives and the fact that you made business impact. Yeah, and I would tie it back to this idea of passion um, that we were talking about before. I mean, I could be submitting for, I don't know who's on the line, but dare I say, you know, hemorrhoid cream. If I'm passionate about that campaign and it had an amazing insight and it did an amazing job in market and I have this executional brilliance, then yes, it, it will do well. It will stand out from the crowd. And so part of your charge is not just to tell that clear, succinct end-to-end -end story, but to do it in a way that we really feel your excitement about it. Makes sense. A question has come in through the um, through the chat. So this is about um, maybe something more tactical here, but entrants often struggle summarizing their methodology. <laughs> so how do you advise writing about an impactful research method without being too light or too detailed? Um, well, I can start. I think Anne will have some insight to this too, but I think Part of this is it is hard to summarize, especially when you um, some brands go on really extensive research journeys. Um, how do you summarize what was most important? I think to me, I want to know, you know, it's great when you do something really interesting and new with your research, but traditional research can also create data that has really impactful insights. Again, it's about the insight, not necessarily saying you had a really cool research methodology. Um, so it's about summarizing what got you to the insight for me. Um, it's what did you do that helped you get to this really great idea that you're now building a foundation from? Um, tell me what was important. I don't need to know all of the pieces that weren't important that got you there. I just need to know what was important, the things that you executed, how you did them, if it's important to how you got to the insight. So again, I think Anne also mentioned this in the business impact piece. I don't need all of the extraneous information of all of your journey. I need to know what's important and then how it got you to insight because insight again is that foundation. So if you're focused on the insight, your research methodology helps you focus there. That's really the important part for summarizing your methodology to me when I look at a case. Yeah, I, I think one of the things you said, Abby, that's so important is it doesn't have to be a groundbreaking methodology. I mean, there are methodologies that have been around since the dawn of man that produce very good campaigns. Mm -hmm. And that is great. So don't feel like you have to be using this groundbreaking methodology to submit. The, the tried and true are fine. And what I'm looking for is less about the methodology, but more about the question itself. And I think this is what you're talking about, Abby, is what was I trying to solve for, answer, learn with this piece of research? Mm -hmm. If you are very clear on that, then you know it will, it will definitely have a clear impact in your case study and stand out. And we won't get lost in sort of the details of, hey, we spoke to 350 people who qualified as X, Y, and Z. We're focused really on what role the research played in the overall process. 
Right. Yeah, it, it helps emphasize, uh, you know, uh, the the dominance of the insight in this particular awards show. You know, we have there are many awards shows, and they they all emphasize different areas. The insight clearly is king or queen, you know, in this case. Um, and then I had a follow up question, Abby. You might want to start it off here, but you know, you talked about insight, sort of a it's 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 really a balance. It's like part deduction, part analysis, and then also like stepping back, seeing patterns. And then maybe this is me interpreting it, pausing. It's just like when you're writing something, you want to pause, you want to come back to it, allowing yourself a little bit of time, dare I say luxury to get to that aha moment. Do you have any advice, <laughs> any other tactical advice how to do that? Yeah, I think from an insights perspective, it is often taking, you know, sometimes when you read an insight, um, you know, it seems so obvious once you've gotten there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's actually almost a part of what's important about an insight is it's that sort of, once you've had that aha, it's like, duh. <laughs> um, but you've used data and information about your audience and what you're trying to do for your business that got you there. So I would say for, for me too, it's, it's really important to think about multiple sources of data because they help you look at context in new ways. That might just be taking the time to literally Google everything you can in an afternoon about your category or your audience. So that gives you the ability to have additional context to the data that you're looking at. So um, for me, I think finding an insight usually is not just as simple as looking at one set of data tabs and going, aha, I found it. It's about taking the time to look at new ways to interpret that data, which requires you to have um, some additional background, context, do some research, what are other people in the category saying, making sure it's unique to you and your brand. Mm -hmm. um, that additional context, I don't think you could ever find secondary research to be a waste of time. Yeah, I, it, it's what we refer to as triangulating on the truth. Yeah looking at it through multiple lenses. You know, when you look at it through multiple lenses, you suddenly realize you have something there. Mm -hmm. And also, Rachel, I think what you said is spot on is you do need time to process. Mm -hmm. I was having this conversation with a client the other day about, oh, it's, it's really hard to find, you know, the, the real truths coming out of qualitative. And I said, well, if you're trying to sort of find it in the moment in time, yes, it's hard. In the moment in time, we can summarize what we heard. Mm -hmm. But where the aha comes from is having that time to almost step back and reflect. And you will suddenly start hearing people in your head of remember that person who talked about X or remember the case study about Y. Yeah. And it's those things that are really the formation of those genuine insights, of those genuine findings. They, I find they are the things that truly stick with us after we've had that moment to step away. Yeah, it, it parallels, I think, a lot of what we do and a lot of our cognitive abilities, right? How do you find it in the moment? It's almost impossible if we only had more time, right? But it's also maybe using the time wisely, like go take a walk, do something else. <laughs> A um, lot of literature out there. Um, I think this is great. I, let's see, oh, one more, okay, one more question. So um, this is a good one. How do you translate that insight to a creative team? You know, assuming that partnership is key. Uh, I would actually say you don't have to translate it. <laughs> I think the best insights are co-created. So in other words, it's not about the research team going off and doing a piece of research and surfacing an insight and then having to persuade the creative team that this is important. The best campaigns are yielded through what, what we refer to as a scrum approach. So in other words, when you have true collaboration of the marketing, the creative agency, and the insight team, and their purpose is aligned around creating great advertising that delivers business success. Mm -hmm. When you have that collaborative working flow throughout the process, 
then there is no need to translate, then there is no need to persuade. It's, we all saw this coming together and let's see how we can address it. I think not a gun campaign is the perfect example. It of is absolutely the perfect example. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I definitely agree that collaboration, I think any of us who have worked in creative research and communications research know how challenging it can be with some places where you, you know, research lives in a silo versus creative. And those, you know, client teams, um, marketer teams where they bring everybody together and it's a strong collaborative uh, process you always get something better out of it because that's the same part that, you know, to me, it's like the same as finding an insight. It's, it's taking different lenses. It's taking different approaches. It's looking at the same data from a bunch of different angles. And when you're collaborative, that's, those are all of the angles sitting in one room. You have the creative angle, the research angle, the client marketing angle, everybody talking together and saying, this is how I see it. And then you get that, oh, we've brought all of these ideas together and now we have this amazing insight because we all look at the consumer in a slightly different way. And that collaboration brings it together. Um, silos, I, I feel personally, rarely create amazing insights um, simply because you don't have enough context and angles to really look at the data and ideas in a you know, really holistic way. And then- I think it speaks to the idea of diversity as well. Like one of the things we don't talk enough about, I think is diversity of thought. Mm -hmm. When you work in these collaborative settings, you get more diversity of thought, more diversity of perspective. And again, that's where the aha comes from is when you can bring together a really diverse group of people with different backgrounds, different experiences, different knowledge bases, Right. And they can all work together and find this really amazing universal human truth around which the brand can center itself. I think, again, that's when you really know you're onto something. Absolutely agree. And general buy-in from your whole team and from your whole group, just everyone wants to feel like they're making an impact and they have a voice. Um, and I think that's really what we see in all these successful campaigns. Yeah. I think that's also what helps everyone feel passion for it, honestly. Yes. I, you rarely feel really passionate about something where you lived in a silo. Um, and it comes through very clearly in these case studies is, you know, I can overlook issues if you didn't write it perfectly. If I'm so excited while I'm reading it because I really felt the passion and the interest that you had in the problem that you were solving. And there's always some sort of problem that you're trying to solve with communications. Why are you passionate about solving it? And if it comes through really clearly and you did all the work and you came out with great insights, great outcomes, it's really hard to not forgive some of the issues in the middle. <laughs> because it's really clear. So, you know, focus on your storytelling, focus on your narrative, but if you can get your passion clearly across, um, then you're, you're definitely, you know, at least a few levels above, you know, the base entry. Yeah. And I think building on the story front, you know, there are a lot of different sections to the submission. And one of the things I can always spot is if different people wrote different parts of the submission. Really good you know, point. It's fine to have contributors. You know, I, I would expect contributors to your submissions, but at the same time, I want to see that thread. I want to see that story. I want to see that everybody who touched this process was aligned against a common goal. That's such a great point. No, I I I, I think that that's one. It, it's tactical and then it's also a little bit more strategic too. So I, I hope people keep that in mind um, because you will be working with teams, whether you have one editor at the end of the day or not, <laughs> but something to keep in mind. Um, I think this has been excellent and obviously helpful. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah now in case she has any more questions and or just for some wrap up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Abby and, and Rachel, thank you so much for participating today and 
sharing your valuable tricks and techniques to better an ARF David Ogilvy Awards written explanation. Um, I think it was really informative. Um, really quickly, in summary, here's five key takeaways from today's session. Um, I think we've said the word insight a lot. So focus on the insight and be consumer led. And a little hint, an insight is not a statistic, but a human truth. Understand the business impact and show proven results. Have a clear and concise narrative. You don't need to write a novel. Adhere to the word and character limits on the submission. They're actually there to help you. Thread the research-driven insight through to creative execution to measurable business impact. This is critical to a winning application, so I'm going to say it one more time. Thread the research-driven insight through to the creative execution to measurable business impact. Lastly, be excited and exciting. Show your passion. Don't hide your excitement for your work. This will all come through in your writing. We hope this event will be a helpful tool for the 2022 applications and beyond. We are recording today's session and we'll share all materials soon. So be sure to pass this along to your team or clients who are looking to enter. These insider tips, nuances, and advice from our jurors are what will take your application from good to great. And now a really quick reminder that the awards are open for entry. You have plenty of time to enter. The deadline to submit is May 27th. We also want you to save the date on October 13th for the awards cocktail party at the Edison Ballroom in New York City to celebrate in person. For the first time, the reception will be preceded by a creative effectiveness event at the same venue. The ARF David Ogilvy Awards are sponsored by Ipsos and TikTok and the creative effectiveness event is sponsored by TikTok. For more information on either the awards application or the event itself, contact us anytime at David Ogilvy Awards at the ARF.org. Thank you all for attending. Don't forget to take the short survey at the close of the event, and we'll see you next time. Have a great afternoon.